All right. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Hello. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult one to, to deal with. Okay. Well, welcome to our third meeting. Um, I see we've got lots of you guys out there, so mm. I'll, uh, I'll uh, outline what we'll do. I'm going to just cover sharpening. What I want to do is do a, a sort of overview of it and, and cover a few items. It's really something that could be a, a three-week class all by itself. So. Um, forgive me if I don't cover the exact thing that you want to. I'm going to just give it an overview. And then, depending on demand, um, we'll see uh, which, what subjects are, I, you know, I'm, or things that I would uh, want you guys would want, want us to cover um, in sort of little, maybe little 10 minute sections during future meetings. But I'll go over my understanding of sharpening. Now, when I started woodworking, which wasn't that long ago, I, I need to put in this disclaimer that, that uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, I am fool enough to stand in front of a camera. So, um, sharpening was something that, I, when I was a kid, I saw woodworkers doing a lot with their hand tools. And when I started woodworking, before I ever went to a class or read a magazine or anything, I realized that I need to know how to sharpen a hand tool. So. I started out and wore out a few oil stones and uh, managed to get a few chisels way, way out of square and, 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 and um, then give myself some good challenges to get back to. Um, oil stones, I think this is an oil stone. I'm not sure. Um, oil stones are the old fashioned way of doing things. Um, in the last few decades, water stones have come have come to be very popular um, and they work very well. I'll be demonstrating them a little bit. Um, and then we've had some more recent introductions such as diamond plates and so, um, artificial sapphire, basically. It's a, a ceramic stone. Um, but I'm gonna just go over the basics of getting a single edge blade into reasonably good shape. So if you buy a brand new plane or a, a used plane that, that is perhaps in, in um, not the best of shape, uh, this is an example. It's a really virtually new plane, but it's, uh, it's had the blade nicked slightly. And I can look at the back and see that nobody has ever polished. I put those pen, those marks on there for what I'm about to demonstrate. When you get a new blade, whether it's um, got a very, uh, very flat edge like that, or whether it has a hollow ground like this, perhaps you can see that close up. You can see that there's a slight hollow in there, and you can, there you go, there's a good picture of what it's like. The edges have been sharpened, and I'll go over why that's such an advantage. Um, Shortly, um, but whatever you you get, even something from Lee Nielsen, you need to do something to it. The first thing is to make sure that the back is completely flat. And um, the way that we do that is to grind it on a completely flat surface. Now, knowing the quality of the of this company, I'm going to go to an 8,000 surface and see what happens. Um, 8,000 is about is it is really a polishing grid. Um, and so I need a little water on the water stone. And in order to find out what I need to do, and, and this, is, this is live in so much as I haven't done anything with this blade since I received it a few days ago. Do you want to let me work for you? Let's uh, switch cameras up. OK, yeah, because you don't need to. There we go. That's nice. OK, so all I'm going to do to establish where I'm at is this is a nice flat surface. By the way, I'm going to digress for a moment. If you use water stones, the big thing that you will need is something along the nature of this. Whether you use scary sharp or sandpaper, this is a purpose made uh, lapping tool for water stones. You need to keep them flat. If you don't start with a flat surface, you might as well just go have a beer and go to bed. Um, it's, it's uh, water stones really are, have to be flat 
And uh, the softer they are, or the higher, or the lower they, the higher they, uh, the lower their grip, the quicker they go off a flat. So having something like, if you're doing a lot of sharpening, having that diamond blade is really helpful. Um, I've known people that use a, a cement block. You can use sandpaper. There's a lot of different alternatives, but um, Ken Manassi uses a cement block. Okay, so getting back to the stones, and please folks, feel free, I'm not offended if people interrupt, so please um, feel free to, uh, to interrupt if you want to. So I'm gonna, I've already put permanent marker, really useful tool for sharpening. I've already put um, a little bit of uh, permanent marker on there. And when I'm sharpening a plain blade, as opposed to a chisel blade, the only area I need to sharpen is right there because the rest of it is normally covered by a plate that sits there. So it needs to be nice and flat back here, but it doesn't have to be polished. So I'm gonna, first of all, just take a look at this and see where we are, where are. Okay, that doesn't tell me much, but what it does tell me is that it, there's a little hump here, which if I press a little harder here will probably not be an issue. So I've got a little bit of work. Can you guys see that? You can see some of the permanent marker is gone. Let me just work it for a few strokes. This is exceptional. Usually if you get something that you're gonna restore, you might have to go, go back and start at uh, something like 600. Um, this thing is so flat that it's actually forming a, um, what's the word, a capillary action, I think, mm -hmm. between the two such that it's hard to, uh, without securing this better, it's hard to, to get it. Um, It's hard, hard to, uh, to get it going on there. I don't know if you can see that, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. It's beginning to polish up here and here on the edges, and it's already removed the, uh, the permanent marker in all but the most important points, which is right at the edge here. So that may have to do with the way I'm pressing. With a, with a plain blade, you can actually just polish that little bit if you want to. Of course, being persnickety, I tend to polish a little further back. But that's all you need in terms of polishing. That's now removed my, um, uh, I was gonna say dry erase, my permanent marker, <laughs> and um, already is, is showing a change in the scratch pattern there. I can see it's so, getting much finer Paul, scratch pattern. Yes. I'd like to see if I have this right. That's, so that's a brand new Lee Nielsen blade. And that's an 8,000 grit water stone, which you have flattened with a diamond plate. And what grit or what type of diamond plate did you use? This is made by DMT. It is actually called a dia flat. So it's not meant for, for working blades at all. It's simply for stones. It's called a dia flat lapping plate. Great, thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, I think once you buy one of those, you just never need another one. You know, you never need anything else in terms of, of flattening your water stones. Um, water stones do wear out. The ones at the 8,000 don't wear so quickly. Like I say, the softer they get, like, for example, this guy, I've almost worn out the, uh, if that's 800 or 1,000 grit. Um, there's not much left to that. And uh, that's one reason why I've moved on a little bit from from uh, water stones, but not, not entirely. So, well, well, how did you see that that one was thin and almost out? I couldn't see the detail. Was the sanding, was the polishing surface very thin as a layer on that? I'm sorry, I, I didn't this catch question, the first part. This. <laughs> how do you know that that was almost worn out? Because this started out as, I'm sorry, this started out a half an inch thick. Oh, <laughs> and I've worn it through. 
<laughs> okay. Um, because it's because it's a fairly soft one. This this you can't see. It is a water stone. It was absolutely filthy. It belongs to the shop. But there are two layers there. This is a combination stone. It's actually the cheapest way to get started with water stones. And this, I think, was my first one. So different um, grits on each side. Sorry. Different grits on each side. Absolutely yes. I think this is a six thousand grit on the light side, and about an eight hundred or a thousand on the back side. Thank you. Um, I, I I don't want to plug too many names, but Rockler do sell a kit. I bought one for about eighty bucks. It's a, it's a good starter kit for for water stones. Um, you don't need a whole you know range of 16 water stones in different grits to uh, to get there you know you can get there with two or three um but yes this is a, a it's not actually a brand new new nielsen i bought it as, as a as a used um on, on ebay but anyway i'm not going to take up too much time with the back of this but what we do is we keep working the back of that until it's really nicely polished now the dangers in doing this especially if you start with something that's old and you want to flatten the back of like like this guy the danger of doing that is that using these softer grits you create something where you're going like this in this is exaggerated but you're you're going like that with your blade and so what happens is the edges get curved and the whole thing gets curved and you've actually lost what little flatness you had. So this is a, a careful step. You only do it once. I've taken when I think, did you ever take hand tool joinery? Mm -hmm. So we spent what the first two or three weeks three learning months. how to sharpen a blade. That experience has been the foundation of, of all the sharpening knowledge I know. I, 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 you know, the rest I've either read about, heard from other people or figured out. But, um, but uh, really flattening your back is absolutely critical. Now, when you do, if you ever take that class, what you will have to get for it is, oh, it's here. Sorry, I know this is <laughs> not good um, going, going off screen here. When you buy a blade for, um, for a wooden blade, for example, that you get at somewhere like Hock, it comes with a hollow grind on it. It's usually square, and that's the other critical part, is you make sure that your blade is square. If, you, if that's not square, the first thing you have to do is, is get that right. Oh, sorry, folks. Okay, is to get that right. But the beauty of the hollow grind here is that all I have to do to get a really good edge on it is to lay it on here. I haven't taken the uh, chip breaker off, but I don't need to for the, I don't want to waste your time basically. But what you can do is on a nice flat surface, you just press those two edges down on the surface. And all you're doing is polishing this bit and this bit. Just a few passes. Yeah, so just a few passes, which gives you a couple of advantages. If you get, as it gets dull, it just takes a few moments to redo. And if, you, if you've got a hollow grind, as long as you have the hollow grind on there, of course, eventually it'll go flat. As long as you have that hollow grind on there, it's a piece of cake to show. Oh, I think yes. some of the members may not know the difference between a hollow grind and what you're talking about. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for Okay, I've got this little, let me see if I can make sure. Can you guys see that? I think so. Okay. So the top picture is a picture of a blade like this. It's the Lee Nielsen. It's absolutely flat there, and it's pretty close to flat there. So by the time I polished this up by the same method of holding the flat there, that will be like this up here, ideal. But 
it'll only in on my tools anyway that lasts until i begin to lose the hollow grind or i do something to the tip and then um i mean till i till i lose the uh, the flat surface there um and then i have to come up with another strategy so my second picture is really no the fourth picture here is the hollow grind it's going to, we'll, I'll demonstrate in a minute how we get a hollow grind. But basically the hollow grind, the edge of the, the surface of the blade here, of the bevel rather, has been ground ever so slightly on a wheel. And that means that it has this ground shape, which means that when you're sharpening, you don't have to polish the entire blade here. You just polish this bit and this bit. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. So, going back to hologram. Gosh, you know, I had it all lined up in my head before I started, and I'm losing some of it. But, but um, anyway, this is this is, by the way, a, the old-fashioned kind of blades. They were tapered. Today's blades are not tapered, but they were tapered from the front to the back. And the, this one fits in a European coffin plane. Um, and they were also often tapered from top to bottom, which makes it difficult to square the edge. You have to make a judgment call there. Um, there are still some blades around that are tapered like that. This is from an old Scottish company called Matheson, who are actually famous for, for very high quality planes. But I found it for like two bucks in a coffin. Okay, so um, let's, let's turn to chisels because sharpening chisels is much the same deal. If you have a hollow grind such as this, piece of cake, you put it on the stone, you make sure with however many fingers it takes to keep it flat, that you do keep it flat and you can work it back and forth like this. You can also work it like this. It's a little easier to do it the other. Do we have a, oh, someone checked in. This is one I just found over there. It actually has Dana's name on it. But, um, but anyway, again, that wasn't super polished, but even in just a few strokes, it's, it's getting a little bit of a polish there, again, just on the edges. Okay, now, Okay, so that's talking about the fine tuning of planes. In my opinion, there's three, three aspects to plane sharpening. One is getting the shape right. The second part is actually getting the blade close to sharp, and then there's honing, which is getting it really sharp. And the shaping part is, can we, I, can we turn this towards the top? Sure. Beautiful. Okay, the shaping part is often done on a torment. That's what these blades from Hock um, are done on, or something similar. Um, the advantage, there's a number of advantages to the torment. It's it's not foolproof by any means. You you have to keep an eye on. You have to be conscious of what you're doing. You have to be safe with it. Because if this blade gets bucked around, you don't want your fingers near. But what it is, is it's a very slow spinning wheel that sits in a bath of water. So when you're grinding, you're con it's constantly wet. Um, and that's very important. You have these, this large wheel, which goes out of true, so you have to keep, you have to keep the machine itself tuned up. Um, but I'm going to show you... This is a very, very old plain blade I found in our bucket of old bits and pieces. And it's, it's got a lovely curve to it. It's incredibly dull. And I'm gonna try and start bringing it back to where I can have, I've marked, you can't see because it's so old, but I've marked with a permanent marker, I took a square. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see it's opposite, yeah. What I see is, is going in the opposite direction. I took a square when this was out of the jig and checked it across here and it's very, very curved. But what I did was I put the square across the back of the blade 
and then marked it with a permanent marker. So when I'm getting close to something usable, I'll, I'll be able to see that black marker blade marker to go missing. So I have already set this up. This jig sets it square here. And there are all sorts of bits and pieces that you can use to set this up. What I tend to do is eyeball it. Um, because it, it's not so critical, the angle, the difference between 25 and 26 inches, what's critical is that you get it close to the same each time. So I, I think that maybe if I was smart enough to use these, these measuring devices, I might get it better, but all I gotta do is make one little mistake. So my eye will tell me roughly, and with a small thin blade like this, it won't take long to work. I'm not going to work through the whole thing, but I'll show you how it works. Hey, Paul, just a quick question about the jig. Sorry? Just a quick question about the jig. Um, yes. Do you have a wide variety that you might use, or do you take one jig, and depending upon the angle, you just make adjustments in the jig itself? I missed the sentence there. Uh -huh. Say that again from the beginning. It's okay. Continue. I'll ask later when my microphone's working better. No, it's good. No, go now. ahead. It's good. working great now. I was asking whether the jig you have on that one blade is the same jig you use for all blades and just make adjustments on the jig itself for different angles, or whether you have a whole bunch of different jigs for different angles of grind. Okay. In terms of the angle of the bevel itself, this is the main jig. You can do chisels, you can do plain blades, but there are other jigs as well. There are jigs for, for um, skew blades, there are jigs for carving blades, curved blades, and so on. But for something like a plain blade, this is the jig. For plain blades, there's, question. Question. Sorry. Sorry. there's just one. Does that answer the question? Mike, I guess I was really asking about different angles. You know, you had your uh, jack plane, and it seemed like it was a much steeper angle. And then you had other blades that had different angles. I'm wondering if you do them all with that jig. Do you mean the bevel angle? Let me, let me answer that. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the, the answer to that question is you change the angle by the distance that you push this through. So the distance from here to here will, will determine the angle coming in here. And Got you it. set the angle, we have a jig here that shows it, Paul, kind of, that's, a, that's kind of a little uh, procedure that, that they'll show you in the, in the manuals for it. And it's easily uh, uh, established, but you just change the distance that the blade comes out. If I pulled this back a little shorter, I get a steeper angle. So it's just the, the way the contact is between the wheel and the blade. Short angles, a short distance is gonna give you a steep angle. A longer distance is going to give you a real shallow angle. And so there's some sort of guide that you have, which based on how far it's protruding, it'll get sharper. There's a guide here that shows you how to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dallas. You made that really clear really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. And you can also alter the height. Yeah, of, the, of the guide here. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of adjustments there. Yeah. So, uh, um, anyway, so uh, to, to, to uh, you know me, I'm not, I'm not crazy about measuring anything. So I, I literally eyeballed it. And what I'll do is if, if I get a 27 degree instead of 25, I, I can live with that because I have a trick for dealing with that as well. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I'll just show you guys how it works. And at some point in the future, if there's interest, we'll hold a class, we'll, you know, because I think a lot of people are intimidated by the torment. I was when I took pa Palomar 100 and they said, we'll all learn the torment, it said it. In the, and then the, the, the instructor said, no, we don't teach that anymore. <laughs> so um, it took me a while to, to learn it. And the, the key to me about this is this is for, preparing tools. It's, it, to me, it's not for, re, for routine job. Um, you know, I bought one of these well, three, four years ago. I've maybe used it three times. It sits in a closet. I've got one and anytime I get a new chisel or plane, I pull it out. Yeah. And then after that, no. Yeah. 
exactly. Yeah. And I, that's pretty much what I do. If I, and, and sometimes I, uh, I won't even use this with, say, if I get a new, new Lee Nielsen, um, I'll just, because it's got that, already got that flat surface, I won't bother with this. You know, it would be uh, um, counterproductive. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so what this, the, this wheel, you can set it two ways. You can set it so the wheel goes towards you or away from you. I find that coming towards you tends to give you a slightly coarser, um, not so fine finish, so I might at some point turn this around. But basically, we are going to, I've already started a little there to establish where I want to be. What I want to be is I want, to, want the first grinding point to be right in the middle of the blade, at the most forward point. That way it's not cutting towards the, the front edge or the back edge of the bevel. And so I've played with this and got a little bit, and you can always, again with this, you can always, if you can, you know, after you've done this a while, you'll find you don't need a permanent marker, but as a beginner, it, it is absolutely essential. Um, so I will do that. I will put that on there. So that's completely black, curved blade. I would normally polish the back of this blade before I put it on a tourney. Uh, you just can't avoid that using your hands. It's really, really hard with hand tools. But if you learn how to do it instinctively, then um, it will stand you in good stead forever. So you'll notice it's nice and glossy. Well, you can't really see the, yes, you can see the glossiness. That's the water coming around and you'll see it'll come up like a wave in front of the blade. And what I'm gonna do, you do not keep the blade static. You run from one side to the other. Um, bearing in mind that in the middle, you're kind of going over it twice as opposed to the edges. The guide itself will actually keep my, keep it straight here. All right, you notice I'm not putting a lot of pressure on. I'm going to take that off. Don't be tempted to do that. What happens is if your wheels go in the wrong way, it'll kick on you. So you see it's taken off some of that black. It's, this blade is about as bad as a blade in condition as a blade I've seen. But what's going to happen is we're eventually going to end up with it nice and square across there and we'll have a hollow grind and then we can do much the same thing as we did with this hollow grind where we put it over and run it along the, uh, the water stone. Um, this is again a patience game and the old uh, thing, we should put it up somewhere on the wall, inspect what you expect. If you aren't looking at this, watching the progress all the time, if you weren't set up to start with, it's gonna, and don't take my technique here as the best by any means. I have very little experience with this. By the way, it has a leather honing strop over this side as well, which I believe one of them is great for carving tools. The other one, I believe some people will actually sharpen their blades just using this. But I, 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 I'm diamond, diamond here, some people put on there. But... Oh, do they? Yeah, right, which we'll talk about. Okay, so you can begin to see, I'll get it as close as I can. The blade is getting hollow there. It's grinding out. It looks like it's grinding more of the front than it is of the back, but I can live with that because there's a lot more of the front to grind out. But if at this point, having done that, that establishing where my blade is cutting, I could now, if I wanna make the, the angle slightly steeper to get you know, further towards the back of the bevel, then I would pull it back slightly. And that way it would go down further that way, that way. And if I need to make it a little further out, I would push it out slightly. You can also adjust. And on the Tormek, on the more modern Tormeks, 
They have a micro adjuster, which is really nice. You can adjust it just a tiny bit. But that's the first thing. You don't just set the thing up, measure the angles, put it on there, sit there, have a sip of coffee and run it back and forth. You've got to keep an eye on it and you've got to make assessment of what you're doing along the way there. The earlier you figure that out, the closer you're going to get to what you want. Um, so my recommendation from what I heard from Dallas now and what I just said myself about my own torment is if you need to use it, come in the shop. But again, talk to somebody about, um, and this is of course when we're open up again, um, about making sure that this, is, this wheel is true. Because again, if your wheel is slightly dome shaped or slightly off to one side, you're, you're never gonna get anything but trouble. So the very first thing is to true it up. I believe we have one, have a unit we do. now. And it's been true. It has, yes, this is, this is really nice, I can see. You know, if there's enough interest, we could do a whole segment just on the Tormac. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I want to continue to address the sharpening yeah. issue, but, but absolutely. I got, I got a couple of planes that are perfect candidates. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. I have several planes that are perfect candidates for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, good. Then we're getting, we're making progress. Hey, Dallas? Yes. Who, do we have somebody that tends to the uh, Tormach and the other sharpening tools that we have, is there somebody who's responsible for that that we could use as a contact point? Well, Paul's been taking the lead on it. Oh, okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. But we do have a few people who are uh, really good with the, the Tormach, and I think we could, uh, we might be able to recruit one of them. Great, thank you. And I think that would lend itself very well to this format as well, yeah. to, a, you know, to a Zoom format, but it would be good. Um, really show it off. Okay, so that, any other questions about the Tormac? I've only covered it very briefly. Um, but as I say, in, in my humble opinion, this is for shaping your tools. Once you've dealt with the Tormac, you put it away and you go back to, to hand. Um, which takes me into our next section. This belongs to the shop. I mostly keep my blades sharp just by putting them on a stone and, and, and hand sharpening them. However, when I get something like, what was it that, oh, they, the jack plane. Um, I, uh, with, with the jack plane that I showed off a couple of weeks ago, as I, I put it together and I ran it down a, a, a board that's here now, and there was a little nail, the head of a nail that wasn't quite sunk deep enough and it just took a tiny nick off of that blade. And I resharpened it using one of these basically. This is a, um, a jig for sharpening plane blades and for sharpening chisel blades. They were, it'll work well with an oil stone, not an oil stone, a water stones, diamond stones, ceramic stones. Um, my one thing I would say about this, uh, in my experience, if I once set this up, say it's a really messed up chisel blade, if I set it up and I start getting it shaped by hand using maybe even 100 grit, but uh, you know, on sandpaper or something like that, but you know, 600 grit and, and, and working the way up, I would keep the jig on, never take it out, until you're done with the jig, basically. If you go up to 8,000 using the jig, that's great. As soon as you take it out, you'll never be able to get it quite back yet in the same way. So this is a here we go. neat little device. On this camera. It's this camera, okay, great. So we've got it here in the shop. Excellent value for money. It, what it does is enables, it enables you, this is the clamp that holds the blade. It's wide enough for a plain blade. There's a roller on the bottom and that roller rolls back and forth on your stone like that. So you set the chisel in here upside down as it were so that the blade, this is the part that we're going to sharpen. 
you don't use these jigs for sharpening the back. It's, it just won't, you know, there's no use for it. Um, so I set this up and I don't know if you can see, but I'm not, I'm reasonably good at eyeballing square, but that's not square. And I have no idea how I'm going to get that angle like that. Well, except by Duffield eyeballing, um, which I could do. But if I want an angle of, tw say, 20 degrees, which is a, a common chisel kind of angle, um, there's this little device which I add on to get set up. And what it does is there's a little rail at the front. I'm getting something wrong here. First of all, that's not the right way up. So I'm going to just get it clamped kind of about where I want it to be. And now I'm going to add this piece onto the rail here. It's got a couple of features. First of all, it sets up the square really nicely, which I'll show you in a minute. There's a little fiddling here, but I have set this up for 17 degrees. You move this little knob along here to different angles that you want. I've set it up for 17 degrees. And what I do is, Make sure this is secured. Get my chisel alongside and up to this point here. I'm not worrying about metal on metal at this point because I'm sharpening this chisel. Um, but I now know that my chisel is square and that it's at the right angle for 17 degrees. But it's not secured yet. So now I want to secure those. Paul, what's that called? The easiest way to answer that is, it is a Veritas Mark II honing guide. Great, thank you. And I think it's in the region of 100 bucks. This is the nicest thing I've ever seen for a jig. Just, just the fact of being able to set up a chisel square right off the bat is, is an incredible leap forward in technology. You can, you can get those little inexpensive ones that are $15, $20 with two wheels on the side. Not near the same deal. This is by far superior. Yeah. I have a very tough one, but again, I, I have to mess with the square and it's not squaring off of a very big piece. This is just beautiful. You know, once you set and clamp this in place, you can take this off. There are, uh, it has another jig as well. It, I, I just read about it in the instructions last night, a dovetail jig. I'm interested to know what that's about. But anyway, now I've got it set up. This thing has another feature. We'll talk about micro bevels in a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, address that. Um, but, uh, but basically, um, you can move this, these little knots to one, two, and three, they, they will give you a slight difference in the angle. So you can get the main bevel correct and then just add a little, what's called a micro bevel to it. Um, I do it by hand, but that's another story. So I would start off with something like this. This one's actually quite nicely polished, but I don't think it's quite straight. So I would use a diamond plate to start this because the one reason I like diamond, or there's a number of reasons I like diamond plates. They don't wear out, which um, for plain blades is, or they do wear out after a long time, but they don't belly out. So for things like plain blades, if you start with something you know is a reliably flat surface, um, you can, uh, you can um, work really well with it for a long time. And when the diamonds fly, finally wear out, this actually was no less than the cost of this one single stone. Um, that was about 80 bucks, I think. And it's got a 600 and a 1200. Uh, you can buy them as separates, but um, diamond plates are great. Um, they can wear out. Um, and you have, just like everything, you have to keep an eye on them. But the, the other nice thing about them is they're fairly aggressive. 
Not as aggressive as a water stone. If you really want to take metal off, a water stone does it very well. But diamond plates are reasonably aggressive. And the other thing about the diamond plates is you don't need a lapping stone. Absolutely. It stays flat, mm -hmm. pretty much. And when, um, when it goes out of flat, the only thing you can do is replace it. But I've never heard of one that goes out of flat. So I want to point out a lot of people will take a chisel, put it on, a, on like this, and they'll run it back and forth. There's a serious danger. Well, it's not a true danger, but it's... It, it, it can be, let me try and get the angle. Can you guys, there we go. Okay, so if you run it back and forth like that, as a human being, your body mechanics are not steady enough as the machine is. And what can happen is you, you think you're getting to a lovely point and you've actually got a rounded tip on it, which is pointless. Is <laughs> the only word I could use. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, so anyway, if you have it set up in a machine and if you are at this point pretty much shaping the blade, much as we did on the Torment here, you can run it back and forth. And again, what I can do, wherever I put it, is I can, when I, start, when I started out, permanent markers all over the place. Um, just, they, they really help whether you're flattening the bottom of a plane or anything like that. They really help tell you where you're actually working. So this, again, I want to keep my, my, my a steady pressure, not excessive pressure. But actually with diamond plates, it's one of the few that if you put a little more pressure on, it does cut a little more aggressively. But the difference is, isn't worth bothering with. And when I'm setting up a tool, I'm... Focus on setting up the tool. I don't really care. I mean, I, you know, I, I get as bored as anyone sitting there flattening a back for three hours. But once it's done, it's done. And it's it's uh, what it does once it's done is much more satisfying than a, than a dull blade. But anyway, so I'll just run this back and forth a little bit. And you can see that the previous cut there. The, it was nicely polished, nicely finished. However, there's my little square. It is not square. So it's, it's actually high on this side, this end. So it makes sense that I'm taking off more of that. That actually, actually, the fact that it starts on a skew like that, when my chisel is straight, tells me that I'm on the right track. That fooled me a couple of times. So anyway, again, I'll work this. This is a 600 grit. If I was at home, I would probably, at this point, I might go to, might go to some sandpaper on a piece of glass, or I might just work away with the 600 grit here. Once I've got this to a flat surface, so once I've got the nice shiny bit all the way back here, I can then check my square here and move on to the higher grit. Until this is set correctly, there's no point whatsoever in going on to a higher grit because everything that we do from now on just improves the scratch pattern on the surface. Um, so that's the key is get the shape of the chisel right first. Then we'll work on sharpening. So the, basically though, once, once you got this set up, I would, uh, you know, as I say, go to, to, um, to a finer grit, even, you know, uh, 220 or, or 100 grit, um, and then work back up through here. Then I flip it over and work it at 1200. At 1200 grit on a diamond plate, you begin to get a little bit of a shine, not much, but just a slight sheet. And, and um, once I've done that, I'll go straight from the 600 diamond plate to either an 8000 water stone, which will then put a, a, a true polish on there, or one of my favorites, the ceramic 
stone. The ceramic stones have a huge advantage. They do, they will wear out, they will belly out. We've got one here in the shop that I thought was perfect until somebody pointed it out. And uh, he, um, he put it on a diamond plate and ground it a little bit. And, um, and uh, it, sure enough, it had a belly in the middle. So up to that point, I thought these things couldn't wear out. But they're incredibly tough. I think they're made out of um, artificial, uh, uh, what's it called? Synthetic sapphires. On, in a ceramic base. Yeah, in a ceramic base. And they, they are really good at polishing. They, 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 you can, this is the ultra fine. You can also get them in fine and medium, and probably a coarse. Um, I've developed over the years, I use these, the combination of different ones, depending on, to be honest, my mood. Um, there's nothing as satisfying as getting a nice polish on a water stone, but this is something that I can have sitting on the bench when I'm doing uh, dozens and dozens of dovetails. And I can just keep sharpening that little quarter inch or half inch blade um, on this. And I'll uh, actually use, once I've got up to the, this is equivalent to somewhere between six and 8,000 grit. This is an 8,000 grit. I personally don't feel the need to go any further than that. My definition of, of how sharp is, it should be is, um, does it do the trick? Does it do what I want it to do? And um, I've got myself to where I can, I can get a really nice crisp edge with, with a chisel and, um, and with plain blades. And I'm happy with that. Other people will, will go on and sharpen. Hey, Paul? More. Did that have I have a question? question? Yes. Um, yeah. I wanted to be sure I understood the progression. And I think I may have dropped a point. Your lowest grit is when you're trying to get square. And you don't progress until you have a square and you've shaped your chisel the right way. Then yeah. you also made the point in the middle with your diagram that there is a back and forth motion you use, but you may end up with a blunted tip. Yes. That that there's no point to it. Do you still do that though in the medium grit range and then only at the very top when you're ready to go to the final edge, just do one direction? I, I actually very, by hand will, will almost, oh, that didn't look very polite, did it? Um, by hand will almost always go in a backward direction. Always. But if, if I'm on, on this, and it's set in this, I can go all the way going back and forth and then just finish up with the backward. Got it, thank you. But yes, I tend to do this because again, it's so easy to tip that puppy up and just put a, a rounded edge on it. So. If you're dragging it away, even if you're not quite right, you, you're not going to ruin it. Thank you. Does that make sense? Hey, Paul, quick question. How, yes. uh, how do you flatten your ceramic stones? I have never had to flatten it. I checked this guy last night. I've had this for two or three years. I don't know if you can see, but there are still machine marks there from when it was made. Okay. And I use this on my bench all the time. Who was it that showed us? Was it Dana? Somebody, when they pointed out that this, he said he, he put it on a diamond stone. The one absolute no-no, never, ever sand this. Oh. Sandpaper will ruin this. You, you know, you might as well throw it away if you do that. I've had mine for years and never needed to flatten it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Paul. Um, the, 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 this, this I just, I have on the bench all the time. And just keep my my my, my uh, chisels touched up. Um, so yeah, so if I'm not using a jig to get to all these points, I work. It, it is a lot of and the other the the main objective of sharpening, and this is how you can tell that not that your shape is correct, but that you actually have the two. Lights funky in here. You actually have the two edges coming together at a, at a point, at a zero point, as it were. Um, the way that you tell is as you're working it, and this is a bit too, I do get a little uh, pencil file on, on this, but as you're working it, whether you're working it this way or this way, or even this way, 
when you have, when those two points meet, you can feel on the backside a little tiny roughness. A wire edge. Yeah, it's called a wire edge. And it, what it is, is it's the edge of the, of the bevel that has turned over slightly, but at the point where it meets the other, other side, the back, of, the back of it. So at that point, I can take that, and what will happen is the wire will flip over to the other side. So now if I feel there, I can feel that rough, roughness there. So I'll do that. You just keep flipping it over until that comes off. You don't actually need to take that wire edge off until you're up at your final, um, final uh, uh, fineness of grit, as it were. You don't need to. I usually do as it goes along, but, but um, that's the point at which you're actually tuning those two edges to be absolutely together. But that wire edge, taking that wire edge is telling you that you've actually hit that sweet spot. Hey, Yes. There's a question in the chat room from Purple Karen about what brand of ceramic stones should we be looking for? Okay. I, I, I won't make a recommendation. I'll tell you what I have, what we have in the shop. What I suspect Dallas has is Spyderco. There are, there, I think Shapton make a ceramic a very high quality one, but in terms of value for money, Spyderco are great. They also make a really nice set of slip stones that are great for carving tools. They were originally a knife business, um, you know, for, for cooks and so on. So they, they started out, they created the triangular stone for serrated knives and so on. So they know a little bit about sharpening. And uh, the thing I like most of this, because I've got a serious case of the dropsies, is I've dropped this a few times and I've got a couple of little chips on the corners. Whereas this guy I dropped the other day and is now virtually useless. It's water. So. Any other questions? Um, okay, uh, where's I going to go next? Oh, I do want to mention using a strop. If you're trying to do, as I've been the last few days, trying to do just little, little fine work, and you really, really want your, your edge of your chisel to be super sharp, an old piece of wood with some leather on it, you can glue it on. I used animal height glue, but you can use contact glue or whatever. Just a um, nice, uh, you know, eighth of an inch thick piece of, of leather of cowhide or something like that. And um, the green com compound is most popular. I think it's chromium oxide, um, but uh, the green seems to work best for, for, for tools, but you can get rouge, you can get all sorts of different compounds. Basically what you're doing is you're adding a super fine compound to, um, that's even finer than the 8,000 to to uh, to the leather and then with this you don't even need to be that precise i'm just i mean that's enough as i'm working chisel working something like this that'll be enough i'll just routinely do that every few minutes every time i feel it getting a little dull and once you get used to using a really sharp blade nothing else will do because you feel like you're just using a hammer when you when you when you cut into a, a piece of wood and it just pushes the great the uh the fibers down instead of cutting through them. Um, it, 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 what it does is it just pulls other stuff out and you just don't get, get that precise cut. But it's really not that difficult to, to, um, to get your blade sharp. So I'm gonna go on to one, to mention one other thing that a lot of woodworkers do that makes their lives a lot easier. This is commonly practiced in, in woodwork, but um, this book, it's out of print now. It's by a guy called Ian Kirby, Sharpening the Water Stones. It's the, the, what got me was a perfect edge in 60 seconds. That's my kind of sharpening, because I, I really would rather be doing the woodwork than sharpening. Um, very good little book costs, you can still buy it on, uh, on um, 
Amazon. That's about eight bucks used. Um, but do basically, have, do we have this in the library? Joe? I don't think so. Oh, we should get it. We should get it. Yeah. But basically, um, I want to let me use this guy. So, which camera is it? This one. Okay. So this is my new E Nielsen. Do you see that little speck of rust? that came from when I was just uh, doing a little work on the water stone. You gotta keep an eye on that. And uh, especially when you're working with water stones because uh, th that rust will build up rapidly. Um, okay, so this is not a perfectly sharp plate. It is sharp. When you get something from Lee Nielsen, it's sharp. It's just not really, really sharp. So imagine that we've polished the back. We've got our bevel really nicely polished. And now I use it, and the first time that I use it, I hit a piece of, some, uh, you know, some kind of inclusion in the wood or whatever, and I get a little tiny nick on it. Now, because this has been, I'm trying to show it, better, because this is flat along here, if I'm going to sharpen that baby up now, I've got to take off all the metal here that I need to take off to take this back far enough to remove the nick, which is exactly what this has. And that's the reason for that is because that's not hollow ground, that's flat ground. Exactly, it's flat ground. So whether it's a hollow ground or whether not, what I tend to do is something use is something you use called a micro bevel. And the micro bevel, this gentleman, Ian, Ad actually um, advocates doing it a little more radically. But basically, what you do is you get your perfect tip there, and then you chop the end or you grind the end off so you have a slightly higher angle of cut, which gives you more toughness, less likelihood to break in, in, in the case of an inclusion anyway, and the only surface that I have to sharpen now, as long as my back is nice and polished, is this edge. So this, for example, is hollow ground. But if I can catch the light, you might be able to see that there's that secondary bevel on there. Even with a hollow ground, I, 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 I put the bevel on because it, I, I find it really helps. What's cool is you get, you, you, this gets done. You put it out, you take it out of the plane, and you put it on your, probably start at 8,000 to make sure that you uh, don't mess anything up. And you take it to the angle. Okay, to the, again, keeping it at that angle. Then you go just a little further, right? Just two or three degrees. And you basically cut that secondary bevel. I'll usually do that on something around six or 1200 grit but what it means is that's it now i can feel even just doing it on here there's a very slight very tiny pencil wire on there which tells me i, I, I again that i did it it's it, you can barely feel paul that was with bevel side down right bevel side down yes okay. so you Set it, you can feel if you've got a, 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 a blade that's big, thick enough. Thick blades are really nice in planes. Um, if you've got a blade that's thick enough, you can, you can, you, you get that flat, you can feel it really well with your fingers and you can push it down and keep it on there. And then, this is the trick, nobody, I don't know why I figured this out, but I thought, okay, so this guy wants me to raise my angle slightly. So, can you guys? Oh, yes. Mike, can you put the camera back on? Uh, they have to do it there. Oh, okay. What happened there? There you go. There we go. Perfect. So, trying to get a, an angle that you guys can see really nicely. So, I would set this, I, I cut this block at, I think, 37 degrees, something like that. I made a couple of them so that I could have them lying around. And what I did was in order to get my angle correct, and, and this is really to teach myself the muscle memory. I don't get these blocks out anymore. 
Um, but in order to teach myself the muscle memory, I'll set my blade there. Then I'll go up to, I'll go up to about the same angle there and work back. And after a while, you find that you can do it at that angle without having to work to use a block. But I found this to be like the most useful thing for setting those angles. Uh, you know, it's a stupid little block of wood, but um, I find it enormously helpful, especially to, to teach that muscle memory if you choose to go with the, uh, the uh, micro route. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, I did want to mention one other thing. Just to show you that these are, these are the common methods, but you can also, if you really want to go wacko, this is diamond paste. And I, I heard about it a couple of years ago when I took a class, but especially um, as a substitute for, um, for honing. Well, not a substitute, but another way to hone. Um, and this, this basically has uh, diamond paste starting at the equivalent of about 600 grit and going down to um, one or two microns. I think it's between two and three microns, something like that, on the finest one. Um, if you ever, you know, I, I, I didn't go with this. I just had to try it out because it was as cheap to buy five cans of paste from the Ukraine as it was to, to, to buy one from somewhere up in California. But um, I, I had to make up an, an individual piece of MDF for each piece. But I actually have sharpened up uh, several pieces on this. The one that it really helped for was I had, someone gave me an in-canal um, gouge, which is a gouge that has the back of the blade on the outside curve and the bevel on the inside curve. And uh, I was using diamond paste and, uh, uh, and dowels to get that inside curve and it worked beautifully. It's really, really useful tool. Um, but anyway, that's another way to go. Um, well, I'm not sure everybody understood. Those blocks are, are just pieces of MDF, correct? They are simply pieces of MDF. And you just put the paste on the, and the reason you have multiples of those because you have different grit on each each of the, the Absolute. Uh, pieces. Absolutely, yes, yes. So, and I arranged them in a stack so you can't put them in the wrong spot. So you always start with the coarsest on top. And uh, it's messy though. After you're done, you have to clean up. When you're done with a ceramic stone, Give it a quick hone and away you go. You have this beautiful polish. Which, there's something satisfying about seeing that polish. Um, I don't think I've covered everything I wanted to, but um, at this point, let me, let me sort of... Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, we better pivot away from that. So, um, any questions before we move on? I, I have a question. Um, when you're getting these sharp edges on things, what do you do to protect edges from little spots of rust forming if you're not going to be back on that chisel or plane in a month um, just to protect it from oxidation or corrosion? Um, the, the, we, the best things for it are jojoba oil and camellia oil um, because they, they don't leave anything on the wood. And they harden up a little bit. They're a bit like the oils that we use to treat wood with, that um, they harden up a little bit. So they, 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 they unlike mineral oil, they, they don't get gooey and sticky and, and attract dust. Um, so I would recommend uh, that, um, keeping them in cabinets, keeping them in drawers. You can buy socks for them that uh, have a chemical in them that prevents, uh, prevents rust. Um, I don't have a big issue where I am at home, but I know it, it's, it's a huge issue. And like you saw, all, all we have to do is leave a thing sitting for half an hour with a drop of water on it and it goes rusty. So. I can tell you that whenever I use my water stones, I immediately put oil on it after I sharpen because there's moisture that gets down the, the metal pores. Yeah. And you'll get rust on it from that. Yeah. So I, I immediately put oil on it as soon as I take it off the, get done sharpening. Right. 
Okay, so uh, any other questions? Cool, well, like I say, I think if, if you guys are interested, and give us some feedback. Um, I haven't uh, looked, I haven't really got into the forum, but I'm gonna get into it this week and post a couple of things. But, but um, if you guys have questions for me, um, uh, or if you, or, or more important, because I know you guys know a lot of stuff as well, if you've got you know, information or um, requests, because uh, you know, at the moment I've, I've got a list of, of things I'm working through, um, but I'm kind of picking the things that, that uh, I think are the most interesting to people. But, but uh, I want to listen to you guys. Okay, so the next thing I think I'd, we'd like to do, I, uh, I'm going to, what I'd like to do, well, if we can, if anybody would like to do a little show and tell, I know that Abby, uh, sorry, Patty has, um, has a, a very interesting uh, thing that she did to a number three plane that uh, she is going to show us. Um, and if any of you others have uh, either things you've made, things you'd like to show us, um, I'd like to go with that. I do want to just very quickly ask an in input from you. I would kind of like to start a little, what tool is that thing? Because there's, there's always tools you come across at the swap meet and so on where you have no idea what they are. And if they're 50 cents, I'd buy them. So this is my first one. Does anyone have any idea what this is? Has a little movable fence. It did have a curved blade that went to a tip and I, until I broke it the other day. And I suspect it's for something to do with woodwork, but does anyone have any idea what this is? Maybe a molding plane? A what? A molding, you know, to cut molding, a certain profile? I, I possibly, quite possibly. I tried sharpening it up, but couldn't get it to work. Maybe it's an upcoming Kickstarter. Could be. <laughs> there you go, yeah. All right. I, ha I have a feeling, I wonder if it was anything to do with boat building. You know? But that's pure speculation. It's obviously homemade. Um, but anyway, what I would like to do is throw this one out. If anyone, you know, some one of you is going to see one of these eventually and come back to me, I'm sure. But if any of you have mystery tools, I've got one other mystery tool to bring in next time. But if any of you guys have them, I'd really like to uh, see if we can't. Uh, Let's start a new thread on the forum and. Yeah, put a photograph of this and put some pictures on it. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. All right, so let, let's, uh, after the show and tell, I'm going to talk about the, the, the Kranoff planes for those of you who are interested in making. Um, I know we're running kind of long, um, and our producers here are, are going to eventually shut us down, but um, uh, do you want to uh, go ahead, Patty, and show us? Sure. Yeah, I'm ready to go. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Take your time. Okay. All right, looks like I have the ability to share with you guys. So I bought on eBay a number three vintage Stanley plane. I restored it, um, got rid of most of the rust and oiled it. So the little red stuff you see up here in the corners is actually wood shavings. Um, what I wanted to do was convert it into a scrub plane. And so what I ended up doing was looking on YouTube, of course, and finding different ways to do it. But one that I followed was to generate a profile, a radius to grind or to shape the iron. So then I took my little template and put it up against my iron and then ground the edge. Um, so let me walk you through, let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Now I think you can see what, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. I have a little show and tell here that I will do. So the first thing I did was to use a Sharpie, the infamous Sharpie that, that Paul's been talking about, to basically create the profile that I wanted 
you know, uh, with the template on the iron after I had flattened the, the backside of the iron. And then creating this profile was trickier than I thought. And initially I thought, well, you know, I'll just use some muscle and some sandpaper on a, uh, and it didn't work. <laughs> it was very difficult to get any real metal removal. So I took it to my high speed grinder, which is always uh, iffy, because uh, you don't want to lose the temper on the iron. But I kept a large uh, glass of water right by it, and every 15 sec, 10, 15 seconds of grinding, I was able to successfully um, remove enough material that then I could take it to my diamond stones and, and then sharpen. So I did, I'm not showing the, the diamond stones I used, but I used a progression. And then after reviewing stuff on YouTube, um, there's kind of this figure eight pattern you use while you're using the diamond stones to kind of create this curve um, on, the, on the profile and get, get a curved bevel. And that was the hardest thing in this whole process. But somehow I muddled through and got a very nice profile. Here I'm showing my final process of stropping um, to get uh, as sharp as I can get it. Hey, Patty, what was yeah. the, again the reason for taking this shape? What was your use case? Uh, I wanted to make a scrub plane. And a scrub plane, uh, let me back up a second, is used to remove a lot of material quickly. So if you have like a slab, and, they're, and you're trying to flatten the slab and you're not using power tools or you don't have access to big power tools, if, unless it's a big slab, you can make these scrub tools and you can buy them already pre-made, but I was decided to try to go cheap buying a $5 plane on eBay and making my own. And what you do is you find with winding sticks or what have you, the high spots, and you use this scrub plane you just really, you go across the grain and you just scrub across the grain. I'll show a picture of that later where it just removes a lot of material. And you, so that's one of the first things you do in preparing the wood to get it as flat as you can. And then you start your normal hand tool plane use to get it, you know, flat and a nice surface. Got it. Flat and a nice surface. Okay. Yep. Okay. So this profile really gouges material out. And, it, and having it in the hand plane lets you use two hands in a, in a planing motion, and it's, it's really nice. So the next thing you need to do um, is I realized I, I put the chip breaker back on. I don't, can you guys see the little red things I circled here? So this is the chip breaker assembled to the iron, and I noticed that I had to just shape the chip breaker as well. Um, so I kind of radiused you know, the, the chip breaker back so that the edge of the, the iron could be fully exposed. Then I, um, the next thing you need to do is open up the mouth on the sole of your uh, plane. So I, I marked off approximately three millimeters, two and a half millimeters or so. Got my trusty Dremel tool and a cutting edge. So I didn't show you the cutting wheel, but the cutting wheel here cut that first kind of um, line there of material away all the way through. And then I used this grinding tip tool to cut the final edges and break through. And here's the final open mouth that I created. I, I had to do a little bit of filing and smoothing to get some burrs off, but it opened up pretty nicely. And here I am just, you know, this is a, a cupped board, a piece of rough lumber I had from some salvaged wood. And this just shows, I mean, it removes big chunks of wood, right? And it's getting it relatively flat. So you go across the grain and you want to, to remove the high spots. And so having it installed in a plane, in this case, a, you know, a number three, so it's not a large sole, but it's large enough to get good you know get the hills out uh, and leave the valleys to the point where you're getting a relatively flat board so that's what i ended up doing and i was kind of surprised myself that it was successful so anyway that's my little show and tell very cool all right that was very cool thank you
You're welcome. So, do I need to do anything? That was, that was really neat. A um, lot of work. Yeah, well, you know, we got time on our hands now. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I've tuned up every single one of my planes. Yeah, I know. The last couple of weeks. Yeah. And it's about 25 of them. Yeah, all right. Hey, Paul, I have a quick question. on yeah. When you restore your planes, do you yeah. use the original plane iron, or do you usually go out and get a replacement iron? I'm cheap, so I use the original if I can. Okay, thank you. Um, but but yeah, we, especially with these older Stanleys, if we if you get blades from Hawk or, or people like that, apparently you can really improve the performance. I haven't uh, had the chance to try that out yet, but uh, uh, one day, one day. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other show and tells? Uh, not a show and tell, but a quick question before you move on. What's your experience and what's your opinion of the workshop uh, system? I think there's one at the shop. It's like the WS3000. I'm, I'm in the process of assessing it. I, I uh, had it brought to my attention a few months ago. And before we shut down, I, I did uh, actually do a couple of plane blades and a couple of chisel blades. I think the thing has potential. A bit like um, Scary Shark, it's it's a not only no, it's it's a very minimal investment to buy it, a couple of hundred dollars, um, but it does use sandpaper. And uh, unless you're willing to get buy you know sticky back sandpaper in large quantities and and, and uh, cut out the wheels, you have to buy those, and it's kind of expensive, but it seems to work really well. And if I were a beginner. I would seriously consider something like that because the investment is not so high. You know, you can probably sell it on for 150 if you had to. Yeah, but do you have a viewpoint? Yeah, on that? I, I think it's I think it's a good system. My my concern is uh, for the shop. I'm just concerned about the consumables for it because the sandpaper is going to wear out real quickly and it's expensive to, to operate. So shopping one plane is going to cost you quite a bit of sandpaper. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions, comments, insults? No? Okay, well, um, we talked very briefly about, uh, um, about uh, Kronoff claims last week, and I, I have some information for you, and uh, you know, I'll try and keep this, this as uh, short as I reasonably can, but first I would ask Mike, if you would uh, bring up that YouTube of Jim Kronoff, because I'd like you to uh, understand a bit about why he designed these planes and what his viewpoint was. There we go. There's no sound at this end. Is anyone hearing that? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Hey, Mike, if it's a big challenge, don't worry about it. We can show it another time. No, or there's you can no send sound. A link and, or put it in the forums. All sorts of options, right? Excellent. Great. Okay. Well, we're, that's all right. So then if we can go back to the camera facing me. <laughs> Uh-oh, somebody's got to sign in. Can you guys out there hear me? Yes. Yes, Paul. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume you can see me as well. So what I wanted to point out is one of the nice things about the Kranoff planes is that they, they're a standardized building system, um, and they're easy for the, for the beginner to use. If you look at a European plane, it's carved out of one chunk of wood, and then it has this tapered blade put in there, and it has a specially designed wedge, 
And, you know, there, there are variations on the theme, but most European wooden planes are made like that. The Kronoff plane is made by laminating so that you can uh, use a single block of wood or you can use different, color, different colors of wood to make it pretty if you want. But basically, the plane is you, you have a central block in which all the mechanics of the plane happen and then a couple of cheats. And uh, I'm gonna throw up a connection in a little bit, or, or Mike is gonna throw up in a little bit, a connection to, um, to an article about building these. But what I do wanna point out is that the Kronoff plane is not restricted to one size of plane. Like this baby, I just couldn't resist. It has a two inch blade. Um, and I, I made it this shape because this is comfortable. Um, but in that video, that's one thing about that Kronoff talks about is that you can make the plane comfortable for your body. Um, so this is a jointer. The only issues I have with it are that it needs to be straightened up on the bottom every now and again because uh, if it was slightly out of tune, it won't give me a thin shaving. This is a jack plane. And no, I can't, well, I can't. Can't really demonstrate it, but it's a fun little um, plane that, that uh, I like to use. Um, this is a block plane, standard block plane, 45 degree angle. I'm sorry, this is not a block plane with a standard angle. This is a low angle block plane. So this is at about the same blade angle as a, uh, a, a 60 and a half the 12, with the 12 inch, 12 degree bed. Because if you add the, because this is bevel down, it's, it's only the angle that it's angled to the ground at, as it were, that, that makes it, uh, um, that govern, governs where you go. So if you add the if this this angle is at about 37 degrees. If you add the 12 degrees of uh, a low bed, I mean a, a low angle bed, and you then add 25 degrees to the bevel up of the plane, it adds up to 37 degrees. So this is a $35 block plane as opposed to uh, the Lee Nielsen. It's a little more temperamental, Mike. Right? Um, and this is a standard block plane. Um, I, I, I use them, um, again, depending on my mood, sometimes, especially if my arthritis is uh, acting up, wooden planes are a little kinder to your, to your, to your body frame. Um, but anyway, I couldn't resist starting to make a new one, so I took a piece of European beach I had, which is the traditional material for making uh, bench planes with. And I don't know if you can see, but the very first thing I did was to laminate four pieces of maple together. This, this is enough width for, enough width to put the blade in there and have cheeks and have a little bit extra as well. Um, so you start with a block like this, ideally for the, for the standards, uh, like equivalent to a number four. You would uh, it, you start with it 11 inches long. I've left this longer just in case I want to make something bigger. You square all the sides, and then you cut the cheeks using your bandsaw, resawing. So now you have two cheeks and a middle. And once you've cut the cheeks out, you then make the inside. And the drawings in the magazine article will. Uh, show that more clearly, but basically you cut one, the, the bed angle, this is the bed angle where the blade's going to go. Um, you cut that at 45 degrees for the standard angle. Um, and then this one is at 60 degrees. Take note, if you use the Canadian magazine article, it recommends that you cut it at 75 degrees. Ignore that, 60 degrees. So the bed, the, where the plane goes, where the plane iron goes is 45, and the other side is 65. Um, magazine breaks it down. Next time I come, I'll have one that's completely broken down, made from this. Um, the biggest challenges are everything has to be square and straight. So 
if you, for example, put that blade in there, like that, if this is, I'm going to exaggerate, but if, if, if this bed is not straight, you're never going to get a play. So there's some care and attention. Apart from the bandsaw, this has all been made by hand. I cut this out, you know, I drilled a hole at one end and then uh, used my uh, combination of chisels and a router plane to do it. Um, the biggest challenge for me is making and lining up the pin in the middle that holds the wedge. Because it's a, the, the blade is held in place with a wedge. And you, you adjust from there. So that's, that's the sort of the basic mechanics of it. So the part, what, what do you need in terms of materials? You need, this is it, block of wood, three inches by, I think this is two and a half. I'll measure it in a moment. A hock. Doesn't have to be a hot blade, Lee Valley make them as well, and in a minute we'll throw up the, the uh, connect the, uh, the links to that. But um, a hot blade with a chip breaker, I can't remember how much they cost, I think they're a little north of 50 bucks. The beauty of it is, if you get a couple of blades, say an inch and a half and a two, and a, and a two inch, you can now make all kinds of planes and use the same blade. I'm just going to transfer it over. Um, <clears throat> so this piece, basically what you're going to do, the width of the blade plus maybe a sixteenth of an inch either side is going to be the width of your piece down the center. And then the cheeks here, you don't even need to plane them because you've already <laughs> cut them. So you're going to have, we're using the bandsaw, you're going to have the same grooves on either side there. So when you put this all back together, you just make sure you, you know, do your uh, car, um, carpenter, wood, woodworker's triangle, cabinet maker's triangle, um, and make sure you keep all your pieces oriented. And, uh, and, you're, and um, you'll come out with something like this. The article's real good if you guys want to go ahead and... Um, and, and do it by yourselves or we can I even thought if the I don't know how many people are interested but we might even want to do like a zoom session at some other point in the week separate from the sea just about doing the crown of play um, and we could do that uh, you know we wouldn't even have to use our producers here we could probably just do something um, where I, I, I we did it from my place um, I just have to make sure that I can get reception in my garage um, or, you know, it's, it, the, the, it's pretty basic woodworking. As I say, the biggest challenge is getting this set up. Um, and what you do is in order to keep everything lined up, you make it larger than the plane that you're going to, going to make and you use these dowels. So this is the other tool that you need is dowels. Use these dowels when you set it up and then when you take it to pieces to glue it up, you use these dowels and uh, they hold it all together, hold everything lined up. So you'll, you'll get everything set up, drill the dowel holes, put the dowels in, and then take it. And that keeps it, keeps it nicely lined up and then you'll have to use a drill press to, to drill the holes for, uh, for the pin in the middle here. Um, so give us some feedback on what you guys would like. Um, and I'm here to help, help, help you guys get there. <laughs> um, any questions? Mike, would you be able to throw up um, maybe the magazine article and then the, the, uh, the Hawk and the Lee Valley connections there? I think there? you put it on chat, the, uh, the information on the Hawk. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, he, already, he already did that. Oh, and, perfect. And then we can get it put on the... Uh, on the forum, if you put that post in the yeah. forum, I think that might be the best for everybody. Okay, right. And they have access to it in the future right. too. Okay. Also, just a quick side note, Dallas. Um, the two URLs were put together contiguously in the post, so people should know those are two different URLs. Uh, you 
try to clip it all and use it, it doesn't produce anything useful. So I did that a little bit uh, uh, chagrined having not seen that, but there are two different URLs, uh, if not three. Yeah, three in that one thing that Mike put in. So just parse them about, well, maybe even four. <laughs> so just parse it. Uh, okay, well. Is this chat being gonna be distributed along with the recording? Because I know the chat is typically separate. Is that correct? Yes, I've not been able to read the chats. Or I, I say I've not been able to. I haven't really made any effort. But yeah, Paul, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer on my part, which is I've never yet seen how to save the chats and post them. That is because I usually, we finish these things, you click end session, and then the chat disappears. So if you remember to clip it before you end the session, I suppose you could keep it. I think it's worth following up on because there's good stuff. I mean, there must've been six or seven links that were put in the chat over the course of this hour and a half. Uh, but so far, Paul, I haven't personally found a way to get that right each time and post it, but it makes sense for us to try. So let, okay. let's see what to do. Yeah, I just I just grabbed it, control yeah. all. So yeah. I do have a a note notepad with all of that stuff so far. So okay, okay thanks. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Great. The chats are recorded. I'll post it on the forum when we get done. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's always my favorite to record you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I would like to say a huge thank you to, to Mike and to Dallas and for producing this whole thing. Um, we, it seems to be becoming a bit of a habit and it's kind of fun. Very uh, And to everyone else who's organizing this, you know, I think in view of the sort of uh, paralysis that we have, it, it's, it's a really uh, nice way to keep in contact. So just, Paul, uh, in general terms, are you thinking about doing another one of these in a couple of weeks? Absolutely. If you, if you want to set it up as a regular thing, um, that's, that's cool with me. Then I can plan for it over two weeks. Okay. Let, let, let's talk about that. And uh, these Saturday mornings seem to work out pretty well, alternating with uh, sort of digital tool stuff, kind of different ends of the spectrum. And uh, it seems to have worked out pretty well the last month and a half or so. So let's try to plan on that, okay? Sounds like a deal to me. Great. Thank right, you, Paul. Saturday morning movies, huh? <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you all for checking in and uh, for being here. Thanks, right. Paul, again. Thank you, Paul. And we're going to end the, end the recording and end the, the session here. So thanks. Talk to you guys later. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone.